This week on the CNET Tech Review, forget the bookstore, head to the app store instead before you head back to school. Plus Spotify tricks for some slick playlists, HP's NV14 may make you rethink your MacBook purchase, and a solar-powered keyboard that makes fluorescent lighting a little more tolerable. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer our own unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start with the good. First off, to all you kids out there enjoying your summer break, I've got three words for you. Back to school. Wah, wah. I know we're barely into August, but some of you are only weeks away from heading back to campus. And we want to make sure that you are fully prepared when you get there. That's why Brian Cooley is here with his top five download recommendations for your smartphones, tablets, and PCs. Whether you're going back to school this year with cool new tech or the same crap you had last year, you can tune it up nicely by downloading this year's hottest programs and apps. I'm Brian Cooley with the top five you really need to get on your gear, sorted by the five major categories of gear you're likely going to be packing. Number five, iPad downloads. Skype is on our list. Now sure, Skype works on just about everything, but on the iPad, you sort of sit there with your mouth open, because it really rocks video calls on that full touch screen. And of course, make sure you're running it on an iPad 2 with the cameras or you're going to be sitting there making a voice call on a big screen device and that's kind of lame. Also look at Netflix. Netflix, I'm convinced, has kept scores of iPad buyers from taking the damn thing back with buyer's remorse because it reminds you why you just spent five to eight hundred bucks on a mobile device that doesn't even make phone calls. It's what portable TV always wanted to be. Number four is our Mac software category, starting off with TweetDeck. Now we always liked TweetDeck, which is now owned by Twitter, by the way, but we especially like the Mac version, which isn't what you always hear. It looks sharp, and it's a great way to merge and manage Twitter and Facebook posts from you, your friends, your followers, and that weird stalker guy. We also are big on Spotify. When you're cranking away on your Mac doing homework, you know you're going to be playing music. Nobody studies in silence anymore. Nothing is hotter in online music right now than Spotify. It just launched in the U.S. right in time for the school year. Their track library is huge, and you pick exactly what you want to hear, not a sounds-like thing the way you do on Pandora. Number three are Android apps, starting off with the Kindle app. The free Kindle app for Android is a simple, clean way to get a Kindle without buying a Kindle. That's more money for beer that way. Now you know all about Kindle books and periodicals, web feeds, PDF support, but the new thing just announced is the Kindle textbook store. You can save huge money by renting digital versions of your textbooks, and you still get to save your notes and highlights from them after your book rental ends, because those are just fun to look at years from now. Also there's Evernote. What is school if not one big organizational pain? Evernote for Android really fills a need for one app that swallows up text notes, voice clips, pictures, files, links, even GPS locations. He'll kind of be like Einstein when he said he never memorized his phone number because he always knew where to look it up. Unless you drop your phone in the toilet, Einstein. Number two, we get to our red hot iPhone category, starting off with the WhatsApp Messenger. Now, put this on your iPhone, and you can save tons on texting, because you'll be able to skirt that texting plan that you pay your carrier for. The catch is, your friends and family who you want to text this way also have to install WhatsApp Messenger. Then they and you are texting and even sharing your locations for free. Yeah, that's going to be a tough sell. Also, we're big on Yelp. Think about it now. If you're heading off to college, especially a new college, you're not leaving without two things. One, a lot of weirdness from your parents, and two, the Yelp app on your iPhone. Now, everyone thinks restaurants when they think Yelp, but it's a great pocket guide to finding anything, like a guitar shop, then a piercing place, then a skateboard store, then a career counseling center. Now, our number one category for back-to-school downloads, it's PC and Windows stuff. Chrome browser at the top of the list. Chrome is really cool, partly because it's really fast and it makes the Google stuff work very well. It's also nicely standards compliant, and it seems to run best in its PC or Windows version. 
Plus, you can turn on syncing so your bookmarks, prefs, and settings will follow you to any other machine that is running Chrome just by you using your Google login. Great for all that itinerant computer use you do in school. Finally, there's Paint.net. Now, come on, you're not going to pay for Photoshop, and you probably don't need that horsepower anyway. So Paint.net's our go-to pick. It's open source, so no cash required. It does all the essential stuff and a few advanced tricks as well, and it seems to get an update like every two days. Now, for more on all our back-to-school picks, software and gear, go to backtoschool.cnet.com. And for more top fives like this, it's top5.cnet.com. I'm Brian Cooley. Thanks for watching. That's a good list, especially since it had 10 items on it instead of five. Consider it a bonus. I would like to add one more item to your download queue, though, especially if you're a Windows user. Bitdefender Total Security 2012. Here is Seth Rosenblatt to tell you why. Hi, I'm Seth Rosenblatt for CNET. And in this first look, we'll be peering behind the walls of Bitdefender Total Security 2012 which you can get from CNETdownload.com. For the second year in a row, Bitdefender's got a new look. The suite now has a dark theme, not unlike Norton. It also retains the modularity of last year's basic interface, but the rest is entirely new. The beginner, intermediate, advanced interface options are gone, replaced with a single approach. This status ring here shows you your security status, green for secure, yellow for problems that require attention, and red for immediate issues. This ought to be narrowed to green and red. The yellow is potentially confusing. Either you've got problems or you don't. The new UI does retain some of Bitdefender's modularity though. This is the default look, but you can swap these security modules around. Each one has an icon at the top for easy recognition and toggles at the bottom to manage the feature. The settings window is well designed with tabs that precisely reflect the options presented in the main window. This year's interface is definitely easier to use than last year's. Enough about looks, let's talk features. There's not a huge amount that's new in Bitdefender 2012, but there are some important improvements. There's a new autopilot that's on by default. It's a smart system that sets most notifications to silent, automatically deals with most threats encountered, and basically ensures that your security is running but not bothering you. The browser add-on, previously limited to Firefox and Internet Explorer, has been replaced by a browser agnostic tool. This means that you'll be protected no matter which browser you use. Rescue mode has been beefed up, and Bitdefender's free Facebook scanning tool, SafeGo, has been baked in. It ought to support Twitter soon, if it doesn't by the time you watch this. The online storage component, SafeBox, now gets file syncing across multiple computers. Bitdefender's efficacy scores have been strong in the past six months on infection prevention, generally in the top five across multiple independent testers. Its scans are fast, but not the fastest. And be warned, you're definitely going to notice its impact on startup and shutdown times. Also, it's got a very aggressive install, and it won't play well even with security programs that are designed to be complementary to the major suites, such as Malwarebytes. Oh, and that corporate philosophy thing? The software maker says it's the computer security equivalent of the mythical Romanian half-wolf, half-dragon, which, let's be honest, is kind of awesome. I think more computer security companies should take on animal avatars kung fu style. And that's your first look at Bitdefender 2012. I'm Seth Rosenblatt. I don't care how boring internet security seems, I want that. Did you hear that, hackers? I've got a wolf dragon watching my back. But if you're looking for something a little more social, Spotify also made Brian's list. Now I know many of you are still waiting for your invites, but if you happen to be among the chosen few already using the service, Sharon has a few tips to make the most out of your playlists. Hey everyone, I'm Sharon Vagnin for CNET.com, and today I'm gonna make you a Spotify playlist master. First, let's talk about the best ways to discover new music for your playlist, starting with Spotify's built-in tools, because the search bar is actually a lot smarter than you think. Instead of just entering the name of an artist or a song title, use search operators. For example, you can search year, colon, 1970 to 1980, and get a list of popular songs from that decade. 
Or if you want a flashback from the new millennium, search year colon 2000. Or you can search for something like genre colon rap space year 1994 and find rap music from that year. This is a full list of search operators, so you can mix and match to find new or old songs for your playlists. Another built-in feature is related artists. Anytime you see a song, click the artist's name and you'll get an overview of their top songs, albums, a bio, and related artists, which is also a good feature for discovering new music. It's not as cool as Pandora, but it'll do. Now that you're a music discovery pro, you can drag and drop music into new playlists. Just remember that all playlists are automatically public, so make sure to make them private if you don't want people discovering your love for Justin Bieber. Just right-click a playlist and uncheck Publish. In this menu, you'll also see the Collaborative Playlist option. This makes it so that anyone you share the playlist with can add songs to it and add it to their sidebar, too. The only catch is that it makes the playlist private to you and those people. Now, if you don't want to do all the work searching for songs and creating playlists, there are a few services that will do it for you, and one of them is Spotabot. Go to Spotabot.com and hit More Options under the search bar. Enter the name of an artist or multiple artists by clicking Add Another. Select the number of tracks and hit Generate Playlist. You'll get an automated playlist of songs similar to the artist or song you entered, which you can then drag and drop right into Spotify. Another way to find playlists is to use a sharing site like ShareMyPlaylist.com, which lets people upload their playlists for everyone to download. You can browse through the collection, search by keyword, or look at the charts to see which playlists are most popular. Once you find one, just click play and it'll launch in Spotify. And don't forget to subscribe at the top to add it to your sidebar. Now here's a tool I love. What if you already made playlists on YouTube, SoundCloud, GrooveShark, and other music services? Well, Playlistify.org will take those playlists and help you transfer them to Spotify. Just go to Playlistify.org and click Bake Your Own Playlist. Then select which service you want to grab your playlist from and follow the instructions. You'll end up with a link that you can then open in Spotify without going through all the trouble of rebuilding it by hand. So now you have a huge list of awesome playlists, but maybe you have too many in your sidebar and it's getting a little crowded. Now this is where Playlist Folders comes in. To create one, just go to File, New Playlist Folder. Give it a name and drag and drop playlists into that folder to keep your sidebar tidy. Once you've got your playlists built, organized, and perfected, it's time to share them. Go back to sharemyplaylist.com and upload your playlist so that anyone can get them. Or just right-click a playlist and select Copy HTTP Link and paste it into Twitter, an email, instant message, or Facebook. When someone clicks it, it'll launch Spotify. Okay, now it's time to go and make your epic playlist. And be sure to send me a link on my Facebook page. And visit howto.cnet.com for more tips, tricks, and guides for your gadgets. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin, and I'll see you on the interwebs. Just remember, as more people start joining Spotify, you'll have more and more friends to share music and build playlists with. And maybe paying the monthly fee for offline listening might seem a little more reasonable. Me personally, I like that. Now, if you like to keep a tidy desktop, a wireless keyboard can be the key to a Spartan workspace, if you're into that sort of thing. But if you're not into dumping a bunch of batteries into your local landfill, check out this new solar keyboard from Logitech. If you're tired of replacing batteries on your computer keyboard, Logitech has a new solar-powered solution that earns our Editor's Choice Award. I'm Justin Yu, Peripherals Editor for CNET.com. This is your first look at the Logitech Wireless Solar Keyboard K750. The K750's killer app is the dual solar panels that power the integrated lithium rechargeable battery inside. They also draw perpetual power from artificial light sources, which means you don't have to be sitting by a window or even outside for the recharge. The lights in your apartment or above your desk at work are fine, and the keyboard automatically senses and stores those charges in ambient light to keep the unit charged. Best of all, Logitech tells us that a single two-hour charge will retain power for the keyboard for up to three months or more if you use the on-off switch in the corner. The K750 may take a little getting used to, though, in terms of typing if you're normally used to the generic keyboard that came with your computer. That's because the keys use scissor-style switches underneath that you have a much shorter vertical clicking distance, which means two things. First, the low-profile switches make for a typing experience that's a lot more like a laptop than a desktop keyboard. 
That means low noise and light touch for actuation. Second, the key switches also make the keyboard super thin. That's just one third of an inch thick. Other notable features include Logitech's perfect stroke uniform key structure and unifying receiver technology. So uh, unifying receiver is this USB port here that links your computer to the keyboard and it sticks out at just about half an inch uh, off your computer and you can power up to six other Logitech devices at a time saving your precious USB ports for other peripherals. Finally, we're really impressed with Logitech's thorough eco-conscious design principles from the PVC free chassis to the 100% recyclable packaging and even a download link instead of a physical driver disc in the box shows the company's push to reduce the user's footprint. For its affordability, eco-consciousness, and thoughtful feature set, we're proud to award Logitech the Editor's Choice Award, and you can read all the details in our full review on CNET.com. But that's going to do it for me. I'm Justin Yu. You just took a first look at the Logitech Wireless Solar Keyboard K750. Thanks for watching. As Justin mentioned, the Solar Keyboard can hold a charge for up to three months. So for those of you who prefer to do your computing in a darkened cave, you could just switch on a light once a quarter and charge that baby and take the opportunity to throw out some of those pizza boxes too. All right, the time has come to take a break, but stick around. We still have a lot more tech review right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on in the good, if you're one of those early adopter types and you want something to tinker around with while you're riding in someone's passenger seat, the Pioneer app radio might be right up your alley. Though it aims for seamless iPhone integration with your car, you might end up being a little disappointed. These days, smartphones pretty much do everything, so why do you need a fancy car stereo? That's the question that Pioneer aimed to answer with its new app radio, the first car stereo to be almost completely powered by your iPhone. I'm Antoine Goodwin. Let's take a first look at this one-of-a-kind device. Now, Pioneer's app radio is aimed squarely at those of you who are absolutely addicted to your iPhones. Now, by itself, it's little more than an AM FM radio tuner, a Bluetooth hands free system, and a kind of fancy, kind of sexy 7-inch capacitive touchscreen. Now, if you don't actually have an iPhone, that's about all that you can expect from this app radio. Pretty disappointing, huh? However, connect an iPhone to the included 30-pin dock connector and the rest of app radio's functionality spring to life thanks to a set of apps that are installed on this connected iDevice. Users are able to browse Google Maps, search for points of interest, and get directions. However, like the Maps app on the iPhone itself, these directions aren't live updating, so you'll want to get a passenger to advance those instructions and probably read the directions aloud for you. Users who want the real deal for turn-by-turn -turn directions will want to install the Motion X GPS Drive app on your iPhone, which does exactly that. It gives you those turn-by-turn -turn directions. Motion X is a free app for the first 30 days. After downloading, though, it's going to cost you about $3 per month thereafter. Users can also add traffic data at an additional cost, or you can just install the Enrix traffic app on your iPhone to gain access to free traffic reports, incidents, and flow data. While you're on the road, you can access your locally stored iPod media or stream audio from the internet with the Pandora Internet Radio or RDO apps on the iPhone, all of which are very cool ways to keep your head nodding on your next long drive. There's also calendar integration and a contact manager which lets you initiate hands-free calls or even email your current GPS location to anyone in your contacts list. Even better, Pioneer's actively working with even more app developers to add more choices to the list of supported apps. However, app radio is about as first generation as hardware comes, so there are some odd interface quirks that you'll need to be aware of before you pull the trigger on this guy. First, you'll notice that every app looks a little bit different, which is fine on a handset, but it can be difficult when you're just trying to skip tracks while you're driving. Next, none of the apps are connected to one another, and they run as separate processes on your phone, so that Enrix traffic data I talked about isn't actually going to factor into your Google Maps or Motion X GPS drive directions. More importantly, none of these apps have a back button built into them, so if you actually want to switch between the apps, for example, you're tired of RDO and you want to listen to Pandora, you'll have to physically touch your phone to switch between the apps using the touch screen, which means you can't really just hide the phone away in a glove compartment and control it with the app radio, which sort of defeats the purpose of actually using the app radio. 
Again, Pioneer promises that it is making strides towards continuously updating the App Radio and the apps that it supports, but for now it feels like it should probably be called App Radio Beta. For you iPhone addicts and early adopters, that may not be such a bad thing, but I think I'd wait for App Radio to bake for a bit longer before taking the plunge. Well, there you have it. For more of my thoughts on this one-of-a-kind car audio receiver, and I've got plenty of them, look for the full review on CNET.com, which is also where you can find more cool first look videos. I'm Antoine Goodwin, giving you a first look at the Pioneer App Radio. The App Radio really could have gone in the bad section of the show this week, but I like the idea and the direction Pioneer's headed, so I'm giving it a pass. Although I'm afraid I can't say the same for the next item, which is truly deserving of the title. Hi, I'm Rich Brown, Senior Editor for CNET.com. Today we're going to take a look at the Acer Aspire X 1920 UR20P. So this is actually a pretty terrible budget desktop, sad to say. Uh, the case is pretty decent. It's a nice simple design, relatively clean here. Got the DVD burner behind the front door there. A few ports, media card reader down here. But the problem is that the system really is sort of underfeatured, even for its low price. Uh, you can find it for about four to five hundred dollars, depending on uh, where you look. Comes with a reasonably fast Intel uh, Pentium dual core chip. They're still making Pentiums. Uh, it has four gigs of RAM, a terabyte hard drive, and that's about it. The system is really pretty spare, and you can get better equipped PCs for the same price. So we really can't recommend you buy the system. Now, in the back of the case, we think you'll see what we mean when we say how uh, underfeatured it is. You've got 5.1 audio support, only two USB ports, a single Ethernet jack, old school PS2 uh, mouse and keyboard inputs, as well as a VGA uh, video out. There's no digital audio, no digital video, uh, no Firewire, eSATA, let alone USB 3. And you can find those features, at least in some combination, on other desktops in this price range, particularly Gateway, which is actually ironic since Acer owns Gateway. So inside the case, the layout is pretty straightforward for a slim tower. There's the Intel CPU here. You can see here's the DVD drive. Underneath that is the hard drive. There's room for only one hard drive inside. Uh, and down here, you kind of can't see it, but there's two memory sticks, not four memory stick slots like you get on some other PCs. For card expansion, the system has no cards, but there is a 1x PCI Express slot, as well as a 16x PCI Express slot. So you could put, say, a half-height graphics card in this PC. But we wouldn't even recommend this as an upgrade platform, just because it's really pretty underpowered and underfeatured, as we mentioned. Now, we don't always expect Slim Towers to deliver, say, the fastest performance or the most features for the dollar. But the fact that they're such tiny cases really makes them well-suited both to desktop environments and the living room. You can imagine putting a system like this next to a TV as a pretty decent home media server. But with no Wi-Fi adapter or no digital video out, that really makes the system tough to recommend for the living room environment. You can also get better bang for your buck in terms of performance in this price range. So for both those reasons, we can't recommend you buy the system. So I'm Rich Brown. This is the Acer Aspire X1920 UR20P. Let's take a look at some of Rich's takeaways from this review. Underfeatured, can't recommend. Underpowered, and how could we forget, pretty terrible. I don't think I have anything to add. So let's finish things up here with this week's bottom line. This summer, Apple has introduced updates to both the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air laptop lines, which is great news to Apple fans with money to burn. Luckily for the other 90% of the world, HP's updated NV14 continues to be a worthy alternative. I'm Dan Ackerman, and we are here taking a look at the latest version of HP's NV14. Now, if you look at this NV14, you may say it looks a heck of a lot like uh, the last NV14, or pretty much all the NV laptops that we've reviewed, and uh, from the outside, it actually is uh, pretty much exactly the same. Uh, that said, that's not necessarily a bad thing on the Windows side. This is about as close as you're going to get to kind of that hefty, metallic MacBook Pro look and feel, and uh, it's really one of our favorite uh, high-end PCs right now. On the inside, the differences are this latest version version of the NV14 has one of Intel's second generation Core i series processor. Uh, this one has a Core i5 in this case. Uh, it also adds USB 3 and uh, it adds a, it's some new touchpad gestures. They've taken this large 
uh, image pad style touchpad at the very front here. And even though it looks the same, um, they've tried to upgrade the two, three, and four finger gestures to work a little bit more like, dare I say, it, a MacBook. Uh, there definitely are some improvements here. However, it's not quite the same as you do get with a MacBook. The two finger scrolling, not quite as smooth. Uh, there's a new handy four finger gesture for bringing up and hiding all your different windows that you're working with. Uh, that's kind of very similar to what a four-finger gesture pre-line used to do on a MacBook. Uh, it's still not quite as smooth and seamless as that. Still, you get most of the things that you're looking for in a higher-end mid-sized laptop. You've got both HDMI and DisplayPort outputs. Of course, that USB 3.0 and some basic AMD graphics. So you could do some, uh, you know, mid-level gaming on here. Even better, the NV14 starts at $999, which is the uh, uh, same as the 13-inch MacBook used to start at. Uh, now you'd have to either get a 999 MacBook Air, the 11-inch model, or trade up to about $1,200 bucks for a 13-inch MacBook Pro, or even more for a 13-inch MacBook Air. So if you're looking for something that's built like a tank, solid metal, and really emulates kind of that uh, MacBook Pro look and feel on the Windows side, uh, you're not going to do better than the uh, HP NV line and this NV14. Definitely hits the sweet spot coming in at $9.99. I'm Dan Ackerman, and that is the HP Envy 14. The bottom line this week what's Apple's return policy again? And also, is it just me, or does the phrase four finger gesture sound a little bit dirty? Don't think about it too hard. Okay, folks, that's our show. Come back next week for an all new CNET tech review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. I'll see you next time and thank you for watching.